and amen, amen. God bless you. We love you so much. Uh, I am, I, I must admit that I've had, uh, you know, quite a challenge trying to pull together uh, what I would preach today. Uh, I have, you know, even up until I was sitting there, about four or five, amen, long passages of scripture that I just wanted to preach today. Amen. But I, I really only want to preach for 20 minutes, so I can't preach four passages. Somebody say amen. Amen. And so uh, we're going to uh, land on Acts chapter number eight, uh, which is the record of a story uh, in the book of Acts. This is, you know, as we are still in our season of Pentecost, certainly on this Sunday when uh, we are having our, our concert and celebration, uh, welcoming and embracing and inviting our LGBTQ loved ones to come on back home. Many of our uh, LGBTQ and, and loved ones who found themselves in church growing up and, and did not find a space and a place for them to uh, be affirmed and not feel as if they are a problem. We want to, amen, affirm and, and celebrate them and give them an opportunity to, to experience a, a service that is built around them and their and their comfort, praise God, hoping that uh, it gives them an opportunity to see that they don't have to, you know, uh, hide here at the way, that you can come and join and be a part of our uh, ministry and congregational worship even on a Sunday. But sometimes you got to do some uh, targeted events, amen, uh, just so they know they're not being tricked and hoodwinked and led astray and bamboozled. Somebody say amen. Amen. And, but, but there's also, uh, you know, this sense that uh, this week uh, we also heard some rulings around the, the ways in which uh, a disproportionate number of black folks and Latino folks will be impacted by law enforcement not having to read their Miranda rights uh, as they get arrested. That was another decision that came down from the Supreme Court that most people don't know about, amen, that you know they, they, they supported a, a lawsuit from a police officer uh, who was literally being uh, prosecuted for violating the civil rights of an individual for not reading uh, their Miranda rights, and now they said that police officers don't have to do that anymore. Uh, and then, for our undocumented loved ones, uh, another ruling came down uh, last week that said that the Border Patrol can uh, uh, have free access into anyone's home who lives 100 miles uh, away uh, from the border. And so if you were to imagine a hundred mile boundary from the border of this country all across the United States, that the Border Patrol can literally kick down your door of your home if they suspect they need to have entry, uh, they passed that law this week as well from the Supreme Court. And so what I am understanding and what I am hoping you understand is that what the Supreme Court and what these wicked, uh, you know, Trump insurrectionist type individuals are doing is they are using uh, issues like abortion and gay marriage uh, and, and, and uh, uh, xenophobia or concerns about uh, immigration to literally uh, pass laws that they would not have to pass through the Congress. Uh, they have created a judicial strategy. Judicial just means legal strategy where they are literally all across this country, they are bringing lawsuits that they know will eventually make it to the Supreme Court. And they have stacked the Supreme Court with such wicked individuals that they are now using the Supreme Court to pass laws that could never get passed through Congress. This is the political project of this country right now, and, and, and they're using so many of us in our faith, our Christian faith, our concerns about, you know, real issues, but with solutions that won't solve the problem. And so as I think of what is the responsibility of the church, what is the responsibility of us in this moment, I do believe that the responsibility for us to one another has to be one of solidarity. That the Holy Spirit, if you recall, amen, uh, when it fell on Pentecost Sunday, it fell because they were all gathered together in one place on one accord. Now, I don't think that they had a, uh, a, 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 a 
a, a, a specialized list of who could come into the upper room on Pentecost Day. I don't think they were asking people's documentation about were they, you know, a citizen. I don't think they were asking folks who they were, uh, you know, in love with or sleeping with. I don't think they were asking folk if they were, you know, black, white, Asian, Latino, polka dot. I don't think they asked them if they were from Earth or from Mars. I think that the spirit drew people into the upper room and it was there, their unity and solidarity unleashed the power of God's spirit. And when those individuals left the upper room, they spread out across literally the whole of the world as they understood it. And they met and ran into people who were curious and who they themselves were being uh, compelled by the spirit unbeknownst to them. I want you to say, say that again. If they met folk who were being compelled by the Spirit without their knowledge, meaning that the Spirit was reaching out to people and those people who were being touched by the Spirit did not even know that it was the Holy Spirit. They were unaware. There is one theologian that talks about the anonymous God, that God can reach out to people and people would, are not even aware that it is God. God is anonymous to them, but it does not make God's outreach any less compelling. Huh? How many know God reaches you even when you don't know God is reaching you? So I got a witness up in here today. Amen. Can you look back over your life and you thought you got up? I, I built a wall around my heart and around my mind and around my life, and somehow you broke through the wall. Mm -hmm. Well, what if you are the construction worker God is trying to use to break through somebody's wall today? What if you are the person, your life, your experience, the tears that you shed, the experiences that you have endured? What if you are the one that God wants to use to make sure that as God engages those who must be engaged, that they are not experiencing this interaction with God in a vacuum? But as a matter of fact, they can understand it. They can know that men, you know, uh, uh, as we will see in this story, uh, uh, verse number 26, the scripture says to uh, this, this brother named Philip. Now, Philip is one of the individuals, one of the disciples who was in the upper room. Philip is uh, not known and mentioned very much in scripture, but Philip, it is believed if you take the Ethiopian Coptic church history seriously. An Ethiopian Coptic church is the longest uninterrupted Christian tradition in the history of our church. Amen. That uh, the person in this story, the Ethiopian eunuch, it is thought that from this encounter went back to Ethiopia and converted, uh, witnessed, shared the news of Jesus, and the whole of Ethiopia launched their own Christian tradition without needing no European help. I wish I could talk to somebody up in here. Amen, we got some, some indigenous Ethiopian folk in the building today, praise God, hanging out with us, amen. Hey, that's how I know it to be true. Amen, that if you took a, took a trip to Ethiopia, you find churches that literally find their origin to the person mentioned in this text. Uh huh. They didn't get they didn't get colonized by the European missionaries. Amen. They didn't have folk from England coming to introduce them to Jesus. As a matter of fact, amen. Some say that they they they, they, they were sending missionaries to try to introduce them uh, 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 pagans. Because I was about to say something else. Well, y'all better pray for me because I'm not in a I'm not in a very accommodating mood today. Uh huh. What is the point? The point is you never know how one encounter could actually have an impact way beyond. You ought to pat yourself on the chest and say, God, help me to have those encounters. Amen. Help me to run into some people, oh God, that, that through my availability. Huh? So, 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 so Philip, fresh out of the upper room experience, minding his own business. Philip is in Jerusalem. Amen. Philip ain't out here trying to, you know, go convert an Ethiopian and, and, and launch a whole 2,000-year-long tradition. 
Philip just trying to figure out what does it mean that I had this experience with the Holy Ghost? What does it mean, God? What are you asking of me in this moment? And I want you to keep asking yourself that question. That is the question for the church in this moment. God, what are you asking of us? God, I know that we got these texts, and I know that we got these experiences. I know that we got our liturgy, but is this all that you are asking of us right now? Because how many know sometimes what God asks you to do, you won't find it necessarily written verbatim in what you're reading in the Bible? That you're going to have to make some interpretive, interpretive moves, praise God. You're going to have to read the scripture and then ask God, Lord, what would you have me do with what I've read? Because yeah. mm -hmm. the scripture don't tell you, amen, uh, you know, how to log into your uh, Facebook account. The scripture don't tell you, amen, how to, you know, change oil in your car. Listen, I wish I had a church. The scripture don't tell you everything. How I many know sometimes you got to make some interpretive moves? To ask and to find out, am I being faithful to God given the time in which I live? And see, the weakness, Lord, I'll help me, Lord, to preach what you want me to say because I feel myself getting pushed and pulled. But So let me read the scripture first, praise God, so I can stay on track. Amen. Acts chapter number 8. This is what happens in verse number 26. Later, God's angel, somebody say God's angel. God will always send a, a messenger your way. Amen. I don't know if it was the Holy Spirit. I don't know if it was an actual angel. I don't know if it was an individual. But somebody spoke to Philip and told Philip, at noon today, I want you to walk over to that desolate road that goes from Jerusalem down to Gaza. And so Philip got up and Philip went. I want you to think about this. You minding your own business. You drinking your Starbucks, your latte. Praise God. You, you walking along the lake, and all of a sudden, a messenger. It could have been the Holy Spirit speaking to Philip. It could have been an angel appearing. It could have been a random individual. And they say to you, listen, God is telling me to tell you, you need to go over to this desolate road. You need to pick up, stop everything you're doing, and, and, and go on over there, uh, down there, on, 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 on the waterfront, down there, and just, just, just hang out, because uh, around noontime, somebody is going to be there awaiting your arrival. Now, if that message came to you, how much faith and confidence in hearing God's voice would you need to have? in order for you to interrupt your whole schedule to go keep that assignment. Could it be, child of God, that God may be trying to speak to some of us in this season, but we are so preoccupied with our own schedules, with our own needs, with our own uh, vocations, that when God is inviting you to participate with what, with what God is doing, we are too busy to do so. And I'm not, in, I'm not in, you know, saying that God is asking you to stop everything you're doing and go hang out on a desolate road waiting for a stranger to come by. But I am saying that some of us know that God is inviting us to make engagement, encounter, and relationship with some folk that we know if God did not make the invitation, we ourselves would never make the engagement. Hello, somebody. So Philip got up and Philip went. He met an Ethiopian eunuch coming down the road. Now, let, let me pause here because an Ethiopian eunuch, amen, uh, me, many of us may know what a eunuch is. We may not know what a eunuch is. It is not all the way clear what kind of Ethiopian eunuch uh, this person was. <clears throat> but often, uh, eunuchs were chosen or the eunuchs were uh, 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 individuals who were uh, selected to serve in the courts of royalty and, and very prominent individuals. And for many reasons, they picked eunuchs. A eunuch was someone who may appear to be androgynous, which means they don't have a particular assigned gender. Or they may be someone who chooses to become mutilated in their uh, uh, organs. So uh, these positions cannot uh, be passed on by birth and legacy to a next generation. Or it may just be someone who decides to uh, uh, be abstinent their whole life. It is not clear. There's all kind of expressions of eunuchs in the ancient world. But part of what the power of this gospel that uh, we are all, uh, you know, uh, uh, participating in 
is that every people group always finds ways to read themselves into the biblical text. That often, you know, I'm not a eunuch, praise God. I'm not androgynous, I've not altered my organs, and I'm certainly not abstinent, amen. Man, I got two kids to show for it. Somebody say amen. Amen. So when I read a Ethiopian eunuch, I don't see nothing particular about this character being included in the story. But if you are someone who has a contested gender or sexuality, I have read uh, certain theologians who see themselves in this story through the Ethiopian eunuch. And I think during a month like Pride, it's worth saying Amen. That there are sometimes some glimpses of God's grace being extended to those who others would try to leave out the story. You ought to pat yourself on the chest and say, I'm glad God included me in this story. Amen. If you're a woman in here, aren't you glad there's some women mentioned in this story? Amen. If you are, if you were thief in here, aren't you glad there's some thieves mentioned in this story? If you broke Oh, disgusted, aren't you glad? Amen. And whatever your identity may be, aren't you glad that you can see yourself in the story? Amen. So all my, my, my queer loved ones, I think you got a little glimpse of yourself in the story today. Amen. As if I could even be so bold, you could argue that maybe some queer folks helped launch some of these churches out here. Amen. 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 It's Pride Month. I can take a little liberties, praise God. Mm -hmm. But but he met an Ethiopian eunuch and coming down the road, the eunuch had been on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem and was returning to Ethiopia where he was the minister in charge of all the finances of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. He was riding in a chariot and reading the prophet Isaiah and the spirit told Philip, climb into the chariot. Running up alongside the chariot, Philip heard the eunuch reading Isaiah and asked the eunuch, do you understand what you are reading? And the eunuch uh, responded, how can I understand without some help? How can I understand without some help? And invited Philip into the chariot with him. And the passage that the eunuch was reading was this, as a sheep led to the slaughter, as quiet and quiet as a lamb being sheared, he was silent, saying nothing. He was mocked and put down, never got a fair trial. But who now can count his kin since he's been taken from the earth? And the eunuch said, tell me, who is the prophet talking about himself or some other? Verse number 34, 35, Philip grabbed his chance. I'm reading from, I think, the, 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 the message. That sounds like the message, amen. Grabbed his chance. Using this passage, Philip uh, used the text and preached Jesus to him. And as they continued down the road, they came to a stream of water. And the eunuch said, well, here's some water. Why? Somebody say, why? Why can't I be baptized? He ordered the chariot to stop, and they both went down to the water. Philip baptized him right there on the spot. And when they came up out the water, the Spirit of God suddenly took Philip off. Philip, I'm done with my assignment. Philip, I'm I'm out. Peace. I, I came. I did what I came to do. Philip didn't linger there. Philip didn't, you know, become his best best friend, Ace Boon Coon. He didn't go back to Ethiopia. He did his job. And he left the eunuch. And that was the last that Philip saw of him. But Philip didn't mind. He had what he come for and went down the road as happy as he could be. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Come on, say thanks be to God. And so, child of God, I want you to imagine that the spirit makes me stand with you. That's what I want you to hear this message today, uh, that the spirit, somebody say the spirit Spirit. makes me stand with you. Come on, say it again. The spirit Spirit. makes me stand with you. Amen. And so as you think of the words we've just read, as you imagine That God's spirit is calling on us, the church, the follower of Jesus, the ones who inhabit the power and the presence of God. That the spirit is first inviting you, child of God, to be available to to the assignment that will be extended to you. That God is requiring you to stand with those who need some help and support. 
that God is not giving you an option to align with the powers, with the forces of, of exclusion, domination, and violence, just because you may have an interpretation of a scripture that has very little to do with the humanity of the one God's asking you to stand with. I mean, what is going on right now with the ways in which we are often forming Christians in this country is that we allow a small number of individuals to teach and preach and train and write uh, and create discipleship and formation uh, pathways for so-called followers of Jesus to understand what it means to follow Jesus, but the way in which they follow Jesus is so fragmented. So you'll pass a law talking about you want to uh, eliminate abortions. But the law that you pass won't eliminate abortions. Amen, 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 amen. Did you know that? Overturning Roe versus Wade is not going to eliminate abortions. As a matter of fact, the best research we have says that when these procedures and product, reproductive health is not uh, extended, safe, and legal, that it actually causes more unwanted pregnancies, which then causes particularly under-resourced, poor, black, brown women to have to go seek out treatment in places that make them less safe. All the data has taught us that, 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 that the way you reduce abortions, if that's really your task, your, 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 your goal, amen, if that's really what this is about, if you really, if we really want to do that, you make health care available to everybody in the country. But these same people who say they want to reduce abortion stand against that. Somebody say it's not about no abortion. Amen. Amen. The second thing they say you should do is you should uh, make contraception free and sex education available to everyone. Why so people, young kids, everybody can learn how their bodies work early on in life? Man, some of you are like, well, I don't want my child to learn that. Well, you know, that's probably, you know, uh, you know why you were so confused for most of your life. Hello, somebody. I'm not trying to pass judgment, but you know you was confused. I know I was confused, praise God. Much of what I learned, I learned sneaking and watching stuff away from the presence of my parents. Wish I could talk to somebody up in here. Amen. Amen. I, I, I never forget, amen, Bishop Yvette Flunder, who's one of our most prominent, uh, uh, open and affirming bishops. She's, you know, been in a, a loving, committed relationship, she said, for almost 30, 40 years. She, she grew up in the Church of God in Christ. Her whole life, her dad was a bishop in the Church of God in Christ. And I was interviewing her last year, and she said, I'm going to tell you something, Pastor Mike. Everything I learned about sex. I learned at the, in the church of God in Christ. She said, I never went to a gay bar. I never went to a doctor to talk about anything. I never, she said, everything, every, literally everything. <laughs> I learned about it going to these conventions, going to these church meetings. Hanging out with my, my, my friends and my, everything I learned. And what, what, what does that say? That says that sometimes, listen to me now, not everybody is qualified to teach you about certain things. Perversion happens when you get the wrong information by the wrong teacher. How many of us know that sometimes we ought to ask trusted individuals? to teach us what we ourselves don't know. That's why, brothers, amen, all of us who are so concerned about this issue, you should sit down and talk to some of our sisters and loved ones who have had to endure some of these uh, 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 cycles of pregnancy. Don't you know that in some of the states right now, they have outlawed, uh, outlawed uh, certain kind of procedures just as a trigger, amen, from, from, from this, 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 this law that was passed. Let me pull this up real quick because I did not even know this. A sister showed this to me, that the treatment for an ectopic pregnancy, how many brothers know what an ectopic pregnancy is? I sure don't. Brother Patrick knows everything, praise God. A treatment for a septic uterus. How many brothers know what a septic uterus is? 
the treatment for a miscarriage that your body won't release. Some of us know what a miscarriage is. The treatment for all of these kinds of challenges in the body of a woman is a, an abortion. And if the woman does not terminate her pregnancy in the midst of that situation, she literally would die. The law that was passed this week in at least half a dozen states is saying that now a woman, if her life is threatened through her pregnancy, would have to die rather than go through a medical procedure to save her life. Now my question is, what kind of individual would pass a law with such fundamentalist, rigid restriction? The only one who would do that is someone who does not have to go through that themselves. Hello, somebody. That's the only one. I'm okay. You know, you know, you know, I, uh, I'm allergic to peanuts and peanut butter. So if you pass a law, I'm trying to make it plain for, so somebody can understand what I'm saying. If you pass a law today that says that I, it is illegal and you could go to jail if you eat peanuts or peanut butter. I'm like, well, I, man, that's not impacting me. I'm not going to lose no sleep over that law. But you know when I will lose some sleep over that law? When my daughters eat some peanuts or peanut butter. And then the system is trying to come and lock them up in jail. Why? Because I have compassion and love for my daughters who are directly impacted by their appetite for peanuts and peanut butter. I'm trying to make it plain to somebody up in here. Part of what we need to do, people of God, as Philip did, the scripture says, that when Philip became aware that his assignment, the Ethiopian eunuch, was, was near him, the scripture says Philip broke out and ran to come alongside the chariot. Ooh. I know some of y'all, y'all, is it the, the light is coming on, praise God. Uh-huh. God is calling some of us fellas, some of us self-righteous folk, some of us who feel like we know everything about everybody's lives to be, to be a little slower to pass and make decisions without talking to somebody and run up alongside them. Lord, I wish I could talk to you today. And get in the chariot with them. Take them to lunch, take them to dinner, get a cup of coffee with them. And understand what is going on in your life that has you in such a state of sadness, depression, exclusion. I mean, I want you to know that there's so many groups in our lives that need some of us to run, run up alongside them. When was the last time you ran up alongside little Pookie and Ray Ray? Hey Amen. Some of us quick to call the police on them. When was the last time you stopped your car and got out and said, hey, young man, can I take you to lunch? Now, don't, don't, don't take him in your car now if you don't know him. Amen. I just want you to know. <laughs> Hey man, get, get, get close to a cafe or something. Say, just meet me right down the street, praise God. <laughs> I just don't want you to you know, go overboard just this, this early in the process. <laughs> hey man, meet me here at the cafe and let me pay for you a meal. And let me ask you some questions why, why you on this corner all the time. Where your mama and them? Where, where your people at? The more I talk to young people over the 15 years of our ministry here at The Way, the young people that are often outside are outside because their mama is working two or three jobs. Their grandmother is raising them and their grandmother don't have the energy to, to put up with them eight hours a day. The most they can do is give you a safe place to lay your head. So you go to school at eight o'clock and you just be home before the sun go down. And then Pookie running around outside with all kind of unattended time. 
and he get caught up with the wrong crowd. Amen, amen. I got caught up with the wrong crowd, and I didn't have a lot of unattended time. Amen, amen. I was with some young folks in Hunter's Point. We used to steal cars. Amen. Well, they stole the car. I just got in it and ride. <laughs> amen, amen. I, you know, I, I, I just want to be clear. I was just a rider. <laughs> uh-huh. When was the last time you ran up alongside somebody who just came home from jail or prison? When was the last time you ran up alongside someone who just been abused and, 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 and taken advantage of? When was the last time you ran up alongside someone who's queer? When was the last time you ran up alongside someone who had to make a choice about their life that was difficult? When was the last time? <laughs> huh, and I'm here to tell you that it is the spirit that makes me stand with you. Amen. Believe me, I, I, I be trying to be self-righteous. I be trying to have my nose stuck up. I be trying to say, oh, you ought to just, uh, but the spirit won't allow me. And I'm here to tell you, you ought to tap into the spirit that is uh, able to give you a compassionate heart. I know you have your theological beliefs. I know you have your, your biblical, you know, 10 scriptures that you like to use as a weapon. Amen. Amen. And all these folks quoting me scriptures. I said, you better leave me alone. Because <laughs> there ain't too many people that know the Bible like I know the Bible. Amen. Amen. I, I'll tell you some scriptures that'll make you question everything. Mm-hmm. Ain't it interesting how folk can pull scriptures out about what you should do with, they li with, with your life. They flying around in private jets. They living in big million dollar mansions. And they gonna tell you what you should do with your life. When there are more scriptures in the Bible about their wealth that says that they are on their way to hell. But when you start talking to the wealthy about their money, Oh, pastor, that's an allegory. Oh, McBride, you know, uh, I, I, you know, I should not have to live a lot like a poor beggar. I say, there's a lot of room. Lord, I feel like preaching in here. Between a poor beggar and a private jet. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. You, 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 you so, you so turned up about uh, the woman's body. What about your private jet? Uh -huh. what, 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 what am I trying to say? I'm trying to say, child of God, that the spirit makes me stand with you. The, 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 the powerful thing about this passage is that the eunuch had questions. And Philip was brought there to help the eunuch understand what the eunuch was reading. Hmm. Think of all the people in your family that need you to help them understand what's going on in their life according to the promises of God in the scriptures. Again, Philip, the scripture don't say Philip asked the eunuch all these sorts of questions. We fill that in the gap. Now, we, we, you know, we, we, we fill in the gap a whole lot of things because, you know, it's like, well, uh, Philip God gets in there and, and, and the eunuch says, you know, uh, what is this? And Philip tells him and the eunuch says, well, uh, there's some water right there. What's keeping me from being baptized? Philip says nothing. They get in the water, get baptized. For some of us who had to jump through 20 hoops before we got to the water. <laughs> we feel cheated. Praise God. Well, he didn't have to go through the baptism class. He didn't have to put on the baptismal clothes. He, he, didn't, he didn't have to have to say the sinner's prayer. He didn't have to pray at the altar for weeks and days at a time. Oh, that can't be a legitimate Christian experience. You just a hater. That's all you are. You ought to pat yourself on the chest and say, Lord, help me not to be a hater. Praise God. Help me not to be someone who looks at someone else's journey 
and be so filled with, 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 with contempt and, and jealousy that it was easier for them than it was for me. How I many know some of us needed the hard way to God? <laughs> some of us needed to go through a little regiment plan, praise God, because God was trying to work some things out of you to make sure that that next step you took would be an authentic step. But I'm glad that there's some Ethiopian eunuchs out there who don't need a whole lot of action steps because they just looking for the water and they just looking for the Phillips and they're just looking for somebody to say yes to the spirit that's saying, will you stand with me? And I want you to know, child of God, that as we go through these very perilous times, God is asking the church, will you stand with them? Will you stand with our sisters? Will you stand with our queer loved ones? Will you stand with Pookie and Ray Ray? Will you stand with our young people? Will you stand with our foster kids? Will you stand with the poor? Will you stand with the outcast? Will you stand with those who need a little bit of help? I refuse to be one of these Christians that are looking for reasons not to stand with you. You may be a little bit upside down, but I'm going to stand with you. You may not have the education, but I'm going to stand with you. You may not have it all together, but it's the Holy Ghost on the inside that is saying, I must stand with you. I must love you. I must protect you. I must comfort you. I must do what is needed to make sure this wicked system, these devilish empires, don't destroy your body don't snatch your mind don't crush your spirit I, I got to stand with you do I have a witness that says I will stand with you I will get next to you I will run alongside you I won't leave you alone I won't leave you isolated but I will stand Stand, 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 stand. I will stand with you. Somebody shout hallelujah. I will stand with you. Why? Because it is the spirit. It is the spirit that makes me stand with you. Why? Because I know what it's like when I'm catching hell on every side and nobody's willing to stand with me. I know what it's like to be able to look around and the only thing I have is God. But how many know sometimes God can feel so far away? Come here, D. Come here, come here. That sometimes it's good to be able to have somebody I can just put my arms around. As a representation of God being with me. Uh, I want you to know our assignment is to stand with one another. Don't let these white supremacist Christians cause you to not stand with your queer loved ones, with your criminalized children, with the sisters who are seeking agency on their bodies, even if they decide to get an abortion. I must stand with you. I'm not going to sit around here and be more judgmental of you than I am of myself. The devil is a lie. I'm going to stand with you. Tell somebody next to you, I'm going to stand with you. Tell them I'm going to stand with you. I make a covenant 
a promise, a commitment to come hell or high water. We will stand with one another. And I pray today, and in the midst of all that's happening, stand to your feet, everybody, that we will stand with one another. I need you. You need me. We're all a part of God's body. Stand with me. Agree with me. We're all a part of God's body. It is his will that every need be supplied. You are important to me. I need you to survive. Oh, you are important to me. I need you to survive. So I pray for you. You pray for me. I love you. I need you to I won't harm you with words from my mouth. I love you. I need you to survive. I pray for you. You pray for me. I love you. I need you to I won't harm you with words from my mouth. I need you to survive. It is God's will, it is that every need be supplied. You are important to, I need you to survive. Oh, you are important to, I need you to. Come on, lift those hands right where you're standing, everybody. Come on, lift those hands, lift those hands, lift those hands. God, we lift our hands to you today. We lift our hands to you. The power that is greater than all other powers. God, our hearts are so heavy. Our minds are perplexed. We are a conflicted person, a conflicted people. We are a traumatized nation, a dysfunctional world. And God, we need you more than ever. So I start with myself, God. It's me and I stand in the need of prayer. It is not my mother. It is not my father. It is not my sister, my my brother. But it is me, oh Lord, and I need you. I need you, God. I need you to heal my mind and my body, my spirit. Lord, I need you, God, to give me strength. I need you to help me, God, because trouble is all around me. It's, it's, it's penetrating my well-being. It's, it's causing my mind to, to, to not be at rest. It's causing my body to be tight. It's causing my, my soul to be troubled. So I need you, God. I need you to help me. I need you to help me. I need you to help me, God. Help me, God, to make the right decisions. Help me, God, to love myself. Help me, God, right now, God, tell the Lord, help me. Help me, God, I need your help, Lord. I need you, God, to remind me that the worst things I've done will not define me. I need you, God, to remind me that no weapon that's formed against me can win. I need you to remind me that my children will be okay, that my family will be okay, that my community will be okay. I need you, God, to remind me that this job won't destroy me, that my mental health can hold together, that my body can recover. I need you to remind me, God. Because if you can remind me, God, I know that I can keep making it. I can be, Lord God, a loving agent in the world. If you can remind me, if you can keep standing with me, God, I know that everything will be okay. So, God, I need you. Somebody say, I need you, Lord. Come on, say it again. I need you, Lord. Somebody say, save me, Lord. Somebody say, heal me, Lord. Somebody say, deliver me, Lord. Do it in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. And God, we pray, oh God, for our families. We pray for our loved ones. We pray for our communities, God. 
We come against the wicked schemes of the devil in high places. God, I pray that you, oh Lord, that you will be a defense against the onslaught of the enemy. I pray, God, that you will help us. Help us as a church. Help us as a community to love one another through this time. To not be overwhelmed and overcome by fear and by anger and by despair. But I pray, God, that your spirit, God, will arrest us, will hold us, will capture and sustain us as a people, as a church, as a community. I pray, God, that we will be who you've asked us to be for one another and we will stand together. In Jesus' name we pray. Hug two or three people, give them a fist bump, an elbow bump, and tell them I will stand with you. Tell them the Spirit is making me stand with you. Give the Lord a hand, praise.